Chapter 12 We get advice from a poodle. We were pretty miserable that night. We camped out in the woods, a hundred yards from the main road, in the marshy clearing that local kids had obviously been using for parties. The ground was littered with flattened soda cans and fast food wrappers. We had taken some food and blankets from Auntie M's, but we didn't dare light a fire to dry our damp clothes. The Furies and Medusa had provided enough excitement for one day. Why didn't we didn't want to attract anything else? We decided to sleep in shifts. I volunteered to take first watch. Annabeth curled up on blankets and was snoring as soon as her head hit the ground. Grover fluttered with his flying shoes to the lowest bough of the tree, put his back to the put his back to the trunk and stared at the night sky. Go ahead and sleep, I told him. I'll wake you if there's any trouble. He nodded, but still didn't close his eyes. It makes me sad, Percy. What does? The fact that you signed up for this stupid quest? No, this makes me sad. He pointed at all the garbage on the ground. In the sky, you can't even see the stars. They've polluted the sky. This is a terrible time to be a this is a terrible time to be a satire satyr. Oh yeah. I guess you'd be an environmentalist. He glared at me. Only a hum only a human wouldn't be. Your species is clogging up the world so fast. Ah, uh, never mind. It's useless to lecture a human. At the rate things are going, I'll never find Pan. Pam? Like the cooking spray? Pan, he cried in the genently. P A N The Great God Pan What what do you think I want a researcher's license for? A strange breeze rustled through the clearing temporary, overpowering the overpowering the stink of the stra- of trash and muck. It brought the smell of berries and wildflowers and clean rainwater. Things that might have once been in these woods. Suddenly, I was nostalgic for something I had never known. Tell me about the search, I said. Grover looked at me cautiously, as if he was afraid I was just making fun. The god of wild places appeared 2,000 years ago, he told me. A sailor of the coast of Ephesus heard a mysterious voice crying out from the shore. Tell them that the great god Pan has died. When humans... When humans heard the news, they believed it. They have been pillaging Pan's kingdom ever since. But for satyrs, satyrs, Pan has our lord. Pan was our lord and master. He protected us and the wild places of the earth. We refused to believe that he died. In every generation, the bravest satyr, satyr, pledge their lives to finding Pan. They searched the earth, exploring all the weirdest, wildest places, hoping to find where he is hidden and wake him from his sleep. And you want to be the searcher? It's my life's dream, he said. My father was a searcher and my uncle Ferdinand. The statue you saw back there? Oh, right, sorry. Grover shook his head. Uncle Ferdinand knew the risks. So did my dad. But I'll succeed. I'll be the first searcher to retrieve a life. Hang on. The first? Grover took his reed pipes out of his pocket. No searcher has ever come back. Once they set out, they disappear. They are never seen alive again. Not once in thousand years? No. And your dad? You have no idea what happened to him. None. But you still want to go? I said amazed. I mean, you really think you'll be the one to find Pan? I have to believe that, Percy. Every searcher does. It's the only thing that keeps us from despair when we look at what humans have done to the world. I have to believe Pan can still be awakened. I stared at the orange haze of the sky and tried to understand how Grover could pursue a dream that seemed so hopeless. Then again, was I any better? How are we going to get into the underworld? I asked him. I mean... What what chance do we have against a god? I don't know, he admitted. But back at Medusa's, when you were searching her office, 
Annabeth was telling me, Oh, I forgot. Annabeth will have a plan all figured out. Don't be so hard on her, Percy. She has a tough life, but she's a good person. After all, she forgave me. His, fo- his voice faltered. What do you mean? I asked. Forgave you for what? Suddenly Grover seemed suddenly Grover seemed very interested in playing notes on his pipes. Wait a minute, I said. Your first keeper job was five years ago. Annabeth has been at camp five years. She wasn't I mean your first assignment that went wrong. I can't talk about it, Grover said, and his quivering lower lip suggested he'd start crying if I pressed him. But as I was saying, back at Menusa's, Annabeth and I agreed there's something strange going on with this quest. Something isn't what it seems. Well, Tur, I'm getting blamed for stealing a thunderbolt that Hades took. That's not what I mean, Clover said. The fur... The kindly ones were sort of holding back like Mrs. Dodds at Yancey Academy. Why did she wait so long to try to kill you? Then on the bus, they weren't as aggressive as they could have been. They seemed plenty aggressive to me. Grover shook his head. They were screeching at us. Where is it? Where? Asking about me, I said. Maybe. Annabeth and I, we both got the feeling that they were asking, that they, they weren't asking about the person. They said, where is it? They seemed to be asking about an object. That doesn't make sense. I know. But if, if we have misunderstood something about this quest, and we only have nine days to find the master bolt, he looked at me like he was hoping for answers. But I, did, but I didn't have any. I thought about what Medusa had said. I was being used by the gods. What lay ahead of me was sore than was worse than petrification. I haven't been straight with you, I told Grover. I don't care about the master board. I agreed to go to the underworld so I could bring back my mother. Grover blew a soft note on his pipes. I know that, Percy. But are you sure that's the only reason? I'm not going I'm not doing it to help my father. He doesn't care about me. I don't care about him. Grover gazed away from the tree branch. Look, Percy, I'm not as smart as Annabeth. And I'm not as brave as you. But I'm pretty good at reading emotions. You're glad your dad is alive. You feel good that he's claimed you. And part of you wants to make him proud. That's why you mailed Medusa's head to Olympus. You want him to notice what you had done. Yeah, well, maybe satyr emotions work differently than human emotions. Because you're wrong. I don't care what he thinks. Grover pulled his feet up onto the branch. Okay, Percy, whatever. Besides, I haven't done anything worth bragging about. We barely got out of New York. And we are stuck here with no money and no way west. Grover looked at the night sky. Like he was thinking about the problem. How about I take first watch, huh? You get some sleep? I wanted to protest, but he started to play. Mozart. Soft and sweet. And I turned away, my eyes stinging. After a few bars of piano, concerto number 12, I was asleep. In my dreams, I stood in a dark cavern before a gasping pit. Grey mist creatures, creatures churned all around me, whispering rags of smoke that I somehow knew were the spirits of dead. They tugged at my clothes trying to pull me back, but I felt compelled to walk forward to the very edge of the chasm. Looking down made me dizzy. The pit yawned so wide and was so completely black, I knew it must be bottomless. Yet I had a feeling that something was trying to rise from the abyss. Something huge and evil. The little hero. And I'm used to voice echoed far down. Too weak, too young, but perhaps you will too. The voice felt ancient, cold and heavy. It trapped around me like sheets of lead. They have misled you, boy, it said. Barter with me. 
I will give you what you want. A shimmering image hovered over the over the void. My mother, frozen at the moment, she had dissolved in shower of cold. Her face was distorted in, with pain. Of the if the minotaur was still squeezing her was still squeezing her her eyes looked directly at me pleading go i tried to cry out but my voice wouldn't work cold laughter echoed from the chasm an invisible force pulled me forward it would drag me into the pit unless i stop unless i stood firm help me rise boy the voice came hungrily bring me the bolt strike a blow against the treacherous gods the spirits of the dead whispered around me no wake the image of my mother began to fade the thing is the pit tightened its unseen grip around me i realized it wasn't interested in pulling me in it was using me to put it pull itself out good i muttered good wake the dead whispered wake someone was shaking me my eyes opened and it was daylight well anubit said the zombie al- the zombie lives i was trembling after from the dream i could still feel the grip of the chasm monster around my chest how long was i sleep long enough long enough for me to cook breakfast anubit tossed me a bag of nacho flavored corn chips from auntie m's snack bar and grover went exploring look he found a friend my eyes had trouble focusing grover was sitting cross-legged on a blanket with something fuzzy in his lap a dirty and naturally pink stuffed animal no it wasn't a stuffed animal it was a pink poodle the poodle yapped at me suspiciously grover said no he's not i blinked are you are you talking to that thing the poodle growled the thing Grover warned, "Is our ticket to West? Be nice to him. You can't talk to animals." Grover ignored the question. "Percy, meet Gladiola." "Gladiola, Percy." I stared at Animeth, figuring she'd crack up at this practical joke they were playing on me, but she looked deadly serious. "I'm not saying hello to a pink poodle," I said. "Forget it." "Percy," Animeth said. "I said hello to the poodle." You say hello to the poodle. The poodle growled. I said hello to the poodle. Grover explained that he had come across Gladiola in the woods and they had struck up a conversation. The poodle had run away from a rich local family who had posted a $2,000 reward for his return. Gladiola didn't really want to go back to his family, but he was willing to if it meant helping Grover. So... Does Gladiola know about the reward? I asked. He did. Re- how? Sorry. How does Gladiola know to, know about the record? The reward? I asked. He read the signs. Grover said, "Duh." Of course, I said. Silly me. So we turn Gladiola. We turn and go Gladiola. Annabeth explained in her best strategy voice. We get money and we buy tickets to Los Angeles. Simple. I thought about my dream, the whispering voices of the dead, the thing in the chasm, and my mother's face, shimmering as it dissolved into gold, all that might be waiting for me in the west. Not another bus, I said wearily. No, Annabeth agreed. She pointed downhill towards the train tracks. I hadn't been able to see last night in the dark. There's an arm track station half a mile that way, according to Gladiola. The westbound train leaves at noon. Chapter Thirteen. I plunge to my death. We spent two days on the Amtrak train, heading west through hills, over rivers, past amber waves of grain. We weren't attacked once, but I didn't relax. I felt that we were traveling around in a display case, being watched from above and maybe from below. That something was waiting for the right opportunity. I tried to keep a low profile because my name and pictures were splattered over the front page of several East Coast newspapers. The Trenton Register News showed a photo 
taken by a tourist as I got off the Greyhound bus. I had a wild look, my, look in my eyes. My sword was a metallic blur in my hands. It might have been a baseball bat or a lacrosse stick. The picture's caption read, 12-year-old Percy Jackson wanted for questioning in the Long Island disappearance of his mother two weeks ago. Is shown here fleeing from the bus where he accosted several elderly female passengers. The bus exploded on an East New Jersey roadside shortly after Jackson fled the scene. Based on eyewitness accounts, police believe the, mo- the boy may be travelling with two teenage accomplices. His stepfather, Gabe Ugliano, has offered a cash reward for information leading to his capture. Don't worry, according to his capture. Don't worry, Annabeth told me. Mortal police could never find us. But she didn't sound so sure. The rest of the day I spent alternately pacing the length of the train. Because I had a feeling hard time sitting, st- I had a really hard time sitting still. Or looking out the windows. Once I spotted a family of centaurs galloping across a field, bows at the ready as they hunted lunch. The little boy centaur, who was the size of a second grader on a pony, caught my eye and waved. I looked around the passenger car, but nobody else had noticed. The adult riders all had their faces buried in laptops, computers or magazines. Another time, toward evening, I saw Something huge moving through the woods. I could have I could have sworn it was a lion, except that lions don't live wild don't live wild in America. And this thing was the size of a hum. Its far glinted gold in the evening light. Then it leaped through the trees and was gone. Our reward money for returning Gladiola, the poodle, had only been enough to purchase the tickets as far as Denver. We couldn't get birds in the sleeping car, so we dozed in our seats. My neck got stiff. I tried not to drool in my, drool in my sleep since Annabeth was sitting right next to me. Grover kept snoring and bleeding and walking me up. Once he shuffled around and his fake foot fell off. Annabeth and I had to stick it back on before any of the other passengers notice. So, Annabeth asked me, once we have caught in, Grover's sneaker readjusted. Who wants your help? What do you mean? When you were asleep, just now, you mumbled. I won't help you. Who were you dreaming about? I was reluctant to say anything. It was the second time I had dreamed about the, I had dreamed about the evil voice from the pit. But it bothered me so much, I finally told her. Annabeth was quiet for a long time. That doesn't sound like Hades. He always appeared on a black throne and he never laughs. He offered my mother in trade. Who else could that be? I guess if he meant help me rise from the underworld, if he wants war with the Olympians, but why ask you to bring him the master bowl if he already has it? I shook my head, wishing I knew the answer. I thought about that what Grover had told me, that the furies on the bus seemed to have been looking for something. Where is it? Where? Maybe Grover sensed my emotions. He snorted in his sleep, muttered something about vegetables and turned his head. Annabeth readjusted his cap so it covered his horns. Percy, you can't barter with Hades. You know that, right? He's deceitful, heartless and greedy. I don't care if his kindly ones weren't as as aggressive this time. This time? I asked. You mean you've run into them before? Her hand crept up to her necklace. She fingered a gla- she fingered a glazed white bead painted with the image of a pine tree, one of her clay and of summer tokens. Let's just say I've got no love for the Lord of Dead. You can't be tempted to make a deal for your mom. What could you do if it was your dad? That's easy, she said. I'd leave him to rot. You're not serious. Annabeth's grey eyes fixed on me. She wore the same expression she had worn in the woods at camp. The moment she drew her sword against the hellhound. My dance resent me since the day I was born, Percy, she said. He never wanted a baby. When he got ho- when he got me, he asked Athena to take me back and raise me on Olympus. 
because he was too busy with his work. She wasn't happy about that. She told him heroes had to be raised by their mortal parent. But how? Um, I mean, I guess you weren't born in a hospital. I figured, I figured on my father's doorstep in a golden cradle, carried down from Olympus by Sephir, the West Wind. You'd think my dad would remember that as a miracle, right? Like maybe he had taken some digital photos or something, but he always talked about my arrival as if it were the most inconvenient thing that had ever happened to him. When I was five, he got married and totally forgot about Athena. He got a regular mortal wife and had two regular bottle kids and tried to pretend I didn't exist. I stared out the window. The lights of sleeping towns were drifting by. I wanted to make Annabeth feel better, but I didn't know how. My mom married a really awful guy, I told her. Grover said she did it to protect me, to hide me in the scent of human family. Maybe that's what your dad did. Annabeth kept worrying at her necklace. She was pinching the gold college ring that hung from the beads. It occurred to me that the ring must be her father's. I wondered why she wore it if she hated him so much. He doesn't care about me, she said. His wife, my stepmom, treated me like a freak. She wouldn't let me play with her children. My dad went along with her. Whenever something dangerous happened, you know, something with monsters, they would both look at me resentfully, like, how dare you put our family at risk. Finally, I took a hint. I wasn't wanted. I ran away. How old were you? See me just when I had started camp? Seven. But you couldn't have gotten all the way to Camp Blood Hill by yourself. No, not alone, no. Athena watched over me, guided me towards help. I made a couple of unexpected friends who took care of me for a short time anyway. I wanted to ask what happened, but Annabeth seemed lost in sad memories. So I listened to the soul to the sound of Grover snoring and gazed out the train windows at the dark fields of Ohio raced by. Towards the end of our second day on the train, June 13, eight days before the summer solstice, we passed through the same Golden Hills and over Mississippi River into St. Louis. Annabeth craned her neck to see the gateway, arch which looked to me like a huge shopping bag handle stuck to a city. I want to do that, she sighed. What? Will something like that? You ever seen the Parthenon, Percy? Only in pictures. Someday, I'm going to see it in person. I'm going to build the greatest monuments to the gods ever. Something that will last a thousand years. I laughed. You? An architect? I don't know why, but I found it funny. Just the idea of Annabeth trying to sit quietly and draw all day. Her cheeks flushed. Yes, an architect. And Athena expects her child to create things, not just tear them down, like a certain god of earthquakes I could mention. I watched the churning brown water of the Mississippi below. Sorry, Annabeth said. That was mean. Can't we work together a little? I pleaded. I mean, didn't Athena and Poseidon even... Ever cooperated? Athena, uh, Annabeth had to think about it. I guess the chariot, she said tentatively. My mom invented it, but Poseidon created horse out of the crest of waves. So they had to work together to make it complete. Then we can cooperate too, right? We rode into the city, Annabeth watching as the arch disappeared behind a hotel. I suppose, she said at last. We pulled into the Amtrak station, Amtrak station downtown. The intercom told us we'd have a three-hour layover before departing for Denver. Grover stretched before he was even fully awake. He said, "Food." Come on, good boy," Annabeth said. "Sightseeing." "Sightseeing." The gateway arch," and she said. "This may be my only chance to ride at the top. Are you coming or not?" Grover and I exchanged looks. I wanted to say no, but I figured that if Annabeth was going, we couldn't very well let her go alone. Grover shrugged. 
as long as there's snack bar with our monsters without monsters the arch was about a mile from the train station late in the day the lines to get in over in that law we threaded our way through the underground museum looking at covered wagons and other junk from 18 from 1800s it wasn't all it wasn't all that thrilling but anabeth kept telling us interesting facts about how the arch was built and grover kept passing me jelly beans so i was okay i kept looking around though at the though at the other people line at the other people and line you smell anything i murmured to grover he took his noise he took his nose out of the jelly bean bag long enough to sniff underground he said distastefully underground air always smells like monster probably doesn't mean anything but something felt wrong to me i had a feeling we shouldn't be here guys i said you know the god symbols of power and beth had been in the middle of reading about the construction equipment used to build the arch but she looked over yeah well hedy grover cleared his throat We are in public place. You mean our friend downstairs? Um, right. I said, our friend, way downstairs. Doesn't we, he have a hat like Annabeth's? You mean the helm of dark? Do- you mean the helm of darkness? Annabeth said, Yeah, that's a symbol of power. I saw it next to his seat during the winter solstice, council meeting. He was there. I asked. She nodded. It's the only time he's allowed to visit Olympus, the darkest day of the year. But his helm is a lot more powerful than my invisibility hat. If what I've heard is true, it allows him to be to become darkness. Crowe confirmed. He can melt into shadows or pass through walls. He can't be touched or seen or heard, and he can't radiate fear so intense it can drive you insane or stop your heart. Why do you think all rational creatures fear the dark? But then, how do we know he's not here right now, watching us? I asked. Annabeth and Grover exchanged looks. We don't, Grover said. Thanks. That makes me feel a lot better. I said. Got any blue jelly beans left? I'd almost mastered my jumpy nerves when I saw the tiny little elevator car we were going to ride at the top of the arch. And I knew I was in trouble. I hate confined places; they make me nuts. We got shoehorned into the car with this big fat lady and her dog, a Chihuahua with a rhinestone collar. I figured maybe the dog was seeing I Chihuahua because none of the guards said a word about it. He started go. We started going up inside the arch. I'd never been in the elevator that went in a curve, and my stomach wasn't too happy about it. No parents? The flat lady asked us. She had beady eyes, pointy coffee-stained teeth, a floppy denim hat, and a denim dress that bulged so much she looked like a blue jelly, blue jean blimp. They are below, Anne Beth told her, scared of heights. Oh, the poor darlings! The Chihuahua growled. The woman said, "Now, now, Sunny, Sony, behave." The dog had beady eyes like its owner, intelligent and vicious. I said, "Sony, is that his name?" "No," the lady told me. She smiled as if that cleared everything up. At the top of the arch, the observation deck reminded me of a tin can with carpeting. Rows of tiny windows looked out over the city on one side and the river on the other. The view was okay, but if there's anything I like less than confined spaces, is a confined space six hundred feet in the air. I was ready to go pretty. Qu- I was ready to go pretty pretty quick. Annabeth kept talking about the structural supports and how she would have made the windows bigger and designed a see-through floor. She probably would have stayed up there for hours, but lucky. For me, the park ranger announced that the observation deck would be closing in a few minutes. I steered Grover and Annabeth towards the exit, loaded them in the eleva- elevator, and I was about to get in myself when I realized there was already two other tourists inside. 
No room for me. The park ranger said. Next car, sir. We'll get out, Annabeth said. We'll wait with you. But that was going to mess everybody up and take even more time. So I said, no, it's okay. I'll see you guys at the bottom. Grover and Annabeth both looked nervous. But they let the elevator door slide shut. The car, their car disappeared down the ramp. Now the only people left on the observation deck were me, a little boy with his parents, and the park ranger, and the fat, la- and the fat lady with her chihuahua. I smiled uneasily at the fat lady. She smiled back, her forked tongue flickering between her teeth. Wait a minute. Forked tongue? Before I could decide if I had really seen that, her chihuahua jumped down and started yapping at me. Now, now, Sonny, the lady said, does this look like a good time? We have all these nice people here. Doggy, said the little boy. Look, a doggy. His parents pulled him back. The chihuahua bared his teeth at me, foam dripping from his black lips. Well, son, the fat lady sighed, if you insist. I started foaming in my stomach. Um, did you just call the chihuahua your son? Shimera, dear, the fat, fat lady corrected. Not a chihuahua. It's an easy mistake to make. She rolled up her denim sleeves, revealing the skin of her arms was scaly and green. When she smiled, I saw her teeth were fangs. The pupil of her eyes were sideways slits like a reptile's. The chihuahua barked louder and with each bark it grew. First to rise, first to the size of a doberman, then to a lion, then became, then, then the bark became a roar. The little boy screamed. His parents pulled him back towards the exit, straight into the park ranger, who stood paralyzed, capping at the monster. The chimera was now so tall it wrapped black. It rubbed its back against the roof. It had the head of a lion with a blood caked mane, the body and hoofs of a giant goat, and a serpent for a tail, a ten foot long diamond back, growling right out of its shaggy behind. The rhinestone dog collar still hung around its neck, and the plate sized dog tag was now easily to read Chimera, rabid, fire breathing, poisonous. If found, please call Tartarus. Exit 954. I realized it hadn't even I hadn't even uncapped my sword. My hands were numb. I was ten feet away from the Chimera's bloody maw, and I knew that as soon as I moved the creature would lunge. The snake lady made a hissing noise that might have been laughter. Be on, be honored, Percy Jackson. Lord Zeus rarely allows me to test a hero with one of my brood. For am I the mother of the monsters? The terrible Echidna. Echidna. I stared at her. All I could think to say was, was isn't that a kind of anteater? She howled her reptilian face, turning brown and green with rage. I hate it when people say that. I hate Australia, naming the ridiculous animal after me. For the Percy Jacks, for that Percy Jackson, my son shall destroy you. The chimera charged, its lion teeth gnashing. I managed to leap aside and dodge the bite. I ended up next to the family and park ranger who were all screaming now, trying to pry open the emergency exit doors. I couldn't let them get hurt. I uncaped my sword, ran to the other side of the deck and yelled, Hey, Chihuahua! The chimeras turned faster than I would have thought possible. Before I could swing my sword, it opened its mouth emitting a stench like the world's largest barbecue pit and shot a column of flame right at me. I drove through I drove through the explosion, the carpet burst into flames, the heat was so intense I nearly seared off my eyebrows. Whether I'd been standing a moment bef- where I had been standing a moment before was a ragged hole in the side of the arch with melt with melted metal steaming around the edges. Great, I thought. We just blow torched a national monument. 
riptide was now a shining bronze bronze blade in my hands and as as the camera turned i slashed as at its neck that was my fate fat, fatal mistake the blade sparked harmless, harmlessly of the dog collar i tried to regain my bl- balance but i was so worried about defending myself against the fiery lion's mouth i completely forgot about the serpent tail until it whipped around and sank its fangs into my calf my whole leg on, was on fire i tried to jab riptide into the chimera's mouth but the serpent tail wrapped around my ankles and pulled me off balance and my blade flew out of my hand spinning out of the hole in the arch and down towards the mississippi river i managed to get to my feet but i knew i had lost i was now weaponless i could feel deadly poison racing up to my chest i remembered i remembered kyren saying that an eclumos would always return to me but there was no pen in my pocket maybe it for it had fallen too far away maybe it only returned when it was in pen form i didn't know and i was going to live long enough to figure it out i backed into the hole in the wall the, the camera advanced growling smoke curling from its lip the snake the snake lady crackled they don't make heroes like they used to eh son the monster growled it seemed in no hurry to finish me off now that i was beaten i glanced at the park ranger and the family the little boy was hiding behind the father's leg i had to protect these people i couldn't just die i tried to think but my whole body was in fire my head felt dizzy i had no sword i was facing a massive fire breathing monster and its mother and i was so and its mother and i was so scared there was no place else to go so i stepped to the edge of the hole far far below the river glittered if i died would the monster go away would they leave the humans alone if you are the son of poseidon and chira hissed you would not fear water jump percy jackson you show me that water will not harm you jump and retrieve your sword prove your blood nine yeah right i thought i read somewhere that jumping into the water from a couple of stories up was like jumping into solid asphalt from here i'd splatter on impact the camera's mouth growled red glowed red heating up from another blast you have no faith angela echidna told me you do not trust the gods i cannot blame you little coward better you die now the gods are faithless the poison is in your heart she was right i was dying i could feel my breath slowing down nobody could save me not even the gods i backed up and looked down at the water i remembered the warm glow of my father's smile when i was a baby he must have seen me he must have visited me when i was in my cradle i remember the swirling green trident that had appeared above my head the night of capture flag when poseidon had claimed me as his son this wasn't the sea this was the mississippi the dead center of usa there was no sea god here die faithless faithless one echidna rasped and chimera sent a column of flame toward my face father help me i prayed i turned and jumped my clothes on fire poising cur- coursing through my veins I plummeted towards the river. Chapter 14 I become a known fugitive. I'd love to tell you I had some deep re- revelation on my way down that I came to the terms with my own mortality, laughed in the face of death, etc. The truth, my only thought was, "Ah!" The river raced toward me at the speed of a truck. Wind ripped the breath from my lungs. steepless and skyscrape skyscrape sky skyscrapers and bridges stumbled in and out of my vision and then boom a white out of bubbles i sank through the murk sure that i was about to end up embedded in a hundred feet of mud and lost forever but my impact with the water hadn't hurt i was falling slowly now bubbles 
trickling up through my fingers. I settled on the river bottom, soundless. A catfish, the size of my stepfather, lurched away into the gloom. Clouds of silt and disgusting garbage, beer bottles, old shoes, plastic bags swirled up all around me. At that po- point, I realized a few things first. I had not been flattened into a pancake. I had not been barbecued. I couldn't even feel the chimera poison boiling in my veins anymore. I was alive, which was good. Second realization, I wasn't wet. I mean, I could feel the coolness of the water. I could see where the fire I could see where the fire on my clothes had been quenched. But when I touched my own shirt, it felt perfectly dry. I looked at the garbage floating by and snatched an old cigarette lighter. No way, I thought. I flickered the lighter. It sparked. A tiny flame appeared right there at the bottom of Mississippi. I grabbed a soggy hamburger, wrapped out of the current, and immediately the paper turned dry. I lit it with no problem. As soon as I had let it go, the flame sputtered out. The wrapper turned back into a smiley, slimy rag. Weird. But the strangest thought occurred to me only last. I was breathing. I was underwater and I was breathing normally. I stood up, thigh deep in mud. My felt, my legs felt shaky. My hands trembled. I should have been dead. The fact that I wasn't seen like, well, a miracle. I imagined a woman's voice, a voice that sounded a bit like my mother. Percy, what did you say? Um, thanks. Underwater, I sounded like I did on recordings. Like a much older kid. Thank you, father. No response. Just a dark drift or garbage down river. The enormous catfish gliding by. The flash of sunset on the water surface. Fire above, turning everything the color of butterscotch. Why had Poseidon saved me? The more I thought about it, the more ashamed I felt. So, I had gotten lucky, I had gotten lucky a few times again before against a thing like the chimera. I had never stood a chance. Those poor people in the arch were probably toast. I couldn't protect them. I was no hero. Maybe I should just stay down here with the catfish. Join the bottom feeders. From, from, from. A riverboat's paddle wheel churned above me, swirling the silt around. There, not five feet in front of me, was my sword. It gleaming bronze hilt sticking up in the mud. I heard a woman's voice again. Percy, take this word. Your father believes in you. This time, I knew the voice wasn't in my head. I wasn't imagining it. Her words seemed to come from everywhere, rippling through the water like dolphins sauna. Where are you? I called aloud. Then through the gloom, I saw her. A woman, the color of the water. A ghost in the current, floating just above the sword. She had long billowing hair and eyes barely visible were green like me. A lump formed in my throat. I said, Mom? No, child. Only a messenger. Though your mother's fate is not as hopeless as you believe. Go to the beach in Santa Monica. What? It is your father's will. Before you descend into the underworld, you must go to Santa Monica. Please, Percy, I cannot stay long. The river here is too foul for my presence. But I was sure the woman was my mother, or a vision of her anyway. Who? How did you? There was so much I wanted to ask. The words jammed up in my throat. I cannot say. I cannot stay, brave one, the woman said. She reached out and I felt the current brush my face like cares. You must go to Santa Monica. And Percy did not trust the gifts. Her voice faded. Gifts? I asked. What gifts? Wait. She made one more attempt to speak, but the sound was gone. Her image melted away. If it was my mother, I had lost her again. I felt like drowning myself. The only problem was, I was immune to drowning. Your father believes in you, she had said. She had also called me brief. Unless she was talking to the catfish, I waded toward 
riptide and grabbed it by the hilt. The cam the chimera might still be up there with its snarky fat mother waiting to finish me off. At the very least, the mortal police would be arriving, trying to figure out who had blown a hole in the arch. If they would found if they found me, they'd have some questions. I capped my sword, stuck the ballpoint pen in my pocket. Thank you, father. I said, begin. I said again to the dark water. Then I kicked up through the tuck and swam for the surface. I came ashore. I came ashore next to a floating McDonald's. A blocking way, a, bl- a block away, every emergency vehicle in St. Louis was surrounding the arch police. Helicopters circled overhead. The crowd of onlookers reminded me of Times Square on New Year's Eve. A little kid said, a little girl said, Mama, the boy walked out of the river. That's nice, dear, her, mom, her mother said, craning her neck towards the ambulances. But he's dry. That's nice, dear. A news lady was talking for the camera. Probably not a terrorist terrorist attack. Pro- probably we are not. Probably not a terrorist attack. We are told, but it's still very clear in the investigation. The damage, as you can see, is very serious. We are trying to get some of the survivors to question them about eyewitnesses, reports of someone falling from the arch. Survivors, I felt a surge of relief. Maybe the park ranger and the family made it out safely. I hoped Annabeth and Grover were okay. I tried to push through the crowd to see what was going on inside the police line. An adolescent boy, another reporter, reporter was saying. Channel 5 was learned, has learned about that surveillance cameras showing an adolescent boy going wild on the observation deck, somehow setting on this freak explosion. Hard to believe, John. But that's what we are hearing. Again, no confirmed fatalities. I ba- I backed away, trying to keep my head down. I had to go a long way around the police perimeter. Uniformed officers and news reporters were everywhere. I had almost lost hope of ever finding Annabeth and Grover when a familiar voice pleaded, Percy! I turned and got tackled by Grover's bear hug, or goat hug, he said. We thought you'd gone to Hades the hard way. Annabeth stood behind him, trying to look angry, but she seemed relieved to see me. Why can't... We can't leave you alone for five minutes. What happened? I sort of fell. Percy, 630 feet? Behind us, a cop shouted, Gangway! The crowd parted and a couple of paramedics hustled out, rolling a parted and a couple of... and a woman on stretcher. I recognized her immediately as the mother of the little boy who had been on the observation deck. She was saying, and then this was a huge dog, this huge fire-breathing chihuahua. Okay, ma'am, the paramedic said, just calm down. Your family is fine. The medication is starting to kick in. I'm not crazy. This boy jumped out of the hole and the monster disappeared. Then she saw me. There he is. That's the boy. I turned quickly and pulled Annabeth and Grover after me. We disappeared into the crowd. What's going on? Annabeth demanded. Was she talking Was she talking about the Chihuahua on the elevator? I told them the whole story of the chimera, Echidna, my high dive act and the underwater lady message. Whoa, said Grover. We've got to get you to Santa Monica. You can't ignore a sum, summons from your dad. Before Annabeth could respond, we passed another reporter doing a news break and I almost froze in my tracks when he said, Percy Jackson, that's right, Dan. Channel 12 has learned about the boy who may have caused this explosion fits the description of a young man wanted by authorities for a serious New Jersey bus accident three days ago. And the boy is believed to be traveling west. For our viewers at home, here is a photo of Percy Jackson. We tucked around the news van and slipped into an alley. First things first, I told Grover. We have got to get out of this town. Somehow, we made it back to Amtrak station without getting spotted. We got on board the train just before it pulled for Denver. The train trudged west as darkness fell, police lights still pulsing against the St. Louis skyline behind us. Chapter 15 A God Buys Us Cheeseburgers The next afternoon, June 17, 
Seven days before the solstice, our train rolled into Denver. We hadn't eaten since the night before in the dining car, somewhere in Kansas. We hadn't taken a shower since Half Blood Hill, and I was sure that was obvious. Let's try to contact Kyron. I want to talk. I want to tell him about your talk with the river spirit. We can't use phones, right? I'm not talking about phones. We want. We wandered through downtown for about half an hour, though I wasn't sure what Annabeth was looking for. The air was dry and hot, which felt weird after the humidity of Saint Louis. Everywhere we turned, the Rocky Mountains seemed to be staring at me, like a tidal wave about to crash into the city. Finally, we found an empty do-it-yourself car wash. We veered towards the stall farthest from the street, keeping our eyes open for patrol cars. We were three adult adolescent hanging out at a car wash without a car. Any cop worth his donuts would figure we were up to no good. What exactly are we doing? I asked, as Grover took out the spray gun. It's like it's seventy-five cents. He grumbled. I've got only two quarters left. Annabeth, don't look at me. She said. The tiny car wiped me out. I fin. I fished out my last bits of change and passed Grover a quarter, which made me two nickels and one drachma from Medusa's place, which left me two nickels and one drachma. From Medusa's place, excellent," Grover said. "We could do it with a spray bottle, of course, but the connection isn't as good, and my arm gets tired of pumping. What are you talking about?" He felt in the quarters and set the knob to fine mist. I Ming. Instead, instant messaging, Iris messaging, Annabeth corrected. The rainbow goddess Iris carries messages for the gods. If you know how to ask, and she's not too busy, he'll do the same. She'll do the same for half bloods. You summon the goddess with a spray gun. Grover pointed the nozzle in the air, and water hissed out in a thick white mist. Unless you know an easier way to make a rainbow. Sure enough, late afternoon light filtered through the vapor and broke into colors. Annabeth held her palm out to me. Crack my please. I hand it over. She raised the coin over her head. Oh God! Oh Goddess! Accept our offering. She threw the drachma into the rainbow. It disappeared in a golden shimmer. Half blood hill. Annabeth requested. For a moment, nothing happened. Then I was looking through the mist at strawberry fields and the Long Island Sound in the distance. He seemed to be on the porch of the big house. Standing with his back to us at the railing was a sandy-haired guy in shorts and an orange tank top. He was holding a bronze sword and seemed to be staring intently at something down in the meadow. Look! I called. He turned, eyes wide. I could swear he was standing three feet in front of me, though through a screen of mist. Except, I could only see the part of him that appeared in the rainbow. Percy! His scared face broke into a grin. Is that Annabeth too? Thank God you are you are okay. We are um fine. Annabeth stammered. She was madly straightening her dirty T-shirt, trying to comb the loose hair out of her face. We thought Kyron. We thought Kyron. I mean, he's down at the cabins. Luke's smile faded. We are having some issues with the campers. Listen, is everything cool with you? Is Grover all right? I'm right here. Grover called. He held the nozzle out at one side and stepped into Luke's line of vision. What kind of issue? Just then, a big Lincoln Continental pulled into the car wash with its steer or turned to maximum hip hop. As the car slid into the next stall, the bass from subwoofers vibrated so much it shook the pavement. Kyron had to. What's the noise? Luke yelled. I'll take care of it. Annabeth yelled back, looking very relieved to have to excuse. Have an excuse to get out of sight. Grover, come on. What? Grover said. But give Percy the nozzle and come on. She ordered. Grover muttered something about girls being harder to understand than the oracle of Delphi, and he handed me the spray gun and followed Annabeth. I readjusted the hose so I could keep the rainbow going and still see Luke. Kyron had a 
Kyren had to break up a fight. Luke shouted to me over the music. Things are pretty tense here, Percy. Word leaked out about Zeus Poseidon standoff. We're still not sure how. Probably the same scumbag who summoned the Hellhound. Now the campers were starting to take sides. It's shaping up. It's shaping up like Trojan War, all over again. And Aphrodite, Ares, and Apollo are backing Poseidon, more or less. Athena is backing Zeus. I shuddered to think that Clarice's cabin would ever be on my dad's side for anything. In the next hall, I heard Annabeth and some guy arguing with each other. Then the music's volume decreased drastically. So what's your status? Luke asked me. Kyren will be sorry he missed you. I told him pretty much pretty much everything, including my dreams. It felt so good to see him, to feel like I was back at camp even before even for a few minutes, that I didn't realize how long I had talked until the beeper went off on the spray machine, and I had realized I only had one minute before the water shut off. I wish I could I could be there. Luke told me. We can't help much from here, I'm afraid. But listen, it had to be Hades who took the master bolt. He was there at Olympus at the winter solstice. I was chaperoning a field trip, and we saw him. But Kyren said the gods can't take each other's magic item directly. That's true, Luke said, looking troubled. Still, Hades has the helm of darkness. How could anybody else sneak into the throne room, throne room, and steal the master bolt? You'd have to be invisible. We were both silent until Luke seemed to realize what he had said. Oh, hey! He protested. I didn't mean Annabeth. She and I have known each other forever. She would never. I mean, she's like a little sister to me. I wondered if Annabeth would like that description. In the stall next to us, the music dropped. Stopped completely. A man screamed in terror. Car doors slammed, and the Lincoln peeled out of the car wash. You'd better go see that. What that was, Luke said. Listen, are you wearing the flying shoes? I'll feel better if I know they have done you some good. Oh, oh yeah. I try not to sound guilty, liar. Really, they've they've come in handy. Really, he grinned. He grinned. They fit in everything. The water shut off. The mist started to evaporate. Well, take care of yourself out there in Denver, Luke called. His voice getting fainter. And tell Grover I'll be better this time. Nobody will get turned into a pine tree if he just. But the mist was gone, and Luke's image faded to nothing. I was alone in wet, empty car wash stall. Annabeth and Grover came around the corner, laughing, but stopped when they saw my face. Annabeth's smile faded. What happened, Percy? What did Luke say? Not much. I lied. My stomach feeling as empty as Big Three cabin. Come on, let's find some dinner. A few minutes later, we were sitting at a booth in gleaming chrome diner. All around us, families were eating burgers and drinking malts and sodas. Finally, the waitress came over. She raised an eyebrows. She raised her eyebrow skeptically. Well, I said, we want to order dinner. You kids have money to pay for it. Grover's lower lip quivered. I was afraid she would start ble- he would start bleating or worse, start eating the l- linoleum. Annabeth looked already looked ready to pass out from hunger. I was trying to think up a sob story or waitress when a rumble shook the whole building. The motor a motorcycle the size of a baby elephant had pulled up t- to the curb. All conversation in the diner stopped. The motorcycle's headlight glared red. Its gas tank had flames painted on it, and a shotgun holstered, prevented to either side, completed with shotguns. The seat was leather, but leather that looked like well, human skin. The guy on the bike would have made pro wrestlers run for mama. He was dressed in a red muscle shirt and black jeans and a black leather duster. With a hunting knife strapped to his thigh, he wore red wraparound shades, and he had the cruelest, most brutal face I'd ever seen. Handsome, I guess, but wicked, with an oily black crew cut, and cheeks that were scarred from many many fights. The weird thing was, 
I felt like I had seen the face before somewhere. As he walked into the diner, a hot dry wind blew through the place. All the people rose as if they were hypnotized, but the biker waved his hand dismissively and they all sat down. Again, everybody went back to their conversation. The waitress blinked as if somebody had just been pressed the rewind button on her brain. She asked us again, You kids have money to pay for it? The biker said, It's on me. He slid into our booth, which was way too small for him, and, cra- and crowded Annabeth against the window. He looked up at the waitress, who was capping at him, and said, Are you still here? He pointed at her, and she stiffened. She turned as if she had spun around, then marched back towards the kitchen. The biker looked at me. I couldn't see his eyes behind the red shades, but bad feelings started boiling in my stomach. Anger, resentment, resentment, bitterness. I wanted to hit a wall. I wanted to pick a fight with somebody. Who did this guy think he was? He gave me a wicked grin. So, year old seaweed's kid, huh? I should have been surprised or scared, but instead I felt like I was looking at my stepdad. Gabe, I want to rip this guy's head off. What's it to you? Percy, um, Annabeth's eyes flashed me warning. Percy, this is... The biker raised his hand. It's okay, he said. I don't mind a little attitude, long as you remember who's the boss. You know who I am, little cousin. Then it struck me. Why this guy looked so familiar? He had the same vicious sneer at the kids at the camp have blood, the ones from Cape and Five. You are Clarice's dad, I said. Aries, God of War. Aries grinned. Aries grinned and took off his shades. Where his eyes should have been, there was only fire, empty sockets glowing with miniature nuclear explosions. That's right, punk. I heard you broke Clarice's spear. She was asking for it. Probably. That's cool. I don't fight my kids' fights. You know what I'm here for. I've heard you were in town. I got a little pro- pro- proposition for you. A little proposition for you. The waitress came back, heaping trays of food, cheeseburgers, fries, onion rings, and chocolate shakes. Aries handed her a few, a few gold track marks. She looked nervously at the coins. But these aren't. Aries pulled out his huge knife and started clearing, cleaning his fingernails. Problem, sweetheart? The waitress swallowed, then left with the cold. You can't do that, I told Aries. You can't just threaten people with a knife. Aries laughed. Are you kidding? I love this century. Best place in Sparta. Don't you carry a weapon, punk? You should. Dangerous world out there. Which brings me to my pro- proposition. I need you to do me a favor. What favor could I do for, for a god? Something a god doesn't have time to do himself. It's nothing much. I left my shield at an abundant water park here in town. I was going on a little date with my girlfriend. We were interrupted. I left my shield behind. I want you to fetch it for me. Why don't you go back and get it yourself? The fire in his eye socket glowed a little hotter. Why don't I turn you into a a prayer dog and run you over with my Harley? Because I don't feel like it. A god is giving you an opportunity to prove yourself, Percy Jackson. Will you prove yourself a coward? He leaned forward. Or maybe you can fight when there's a river to dive into, so your daddy can protect you. I wanted to punch this guy, but somehow I knew he was waiting for that. Aries's power was causing my anger. He'd love it if I attacked. I didn't want to give him the satisfaction. We're not interested, I said. We've already got a quest. Aries's fiery eyes made, made me see things I didn't want to see. Blood and smoke and corpses on the battlefield. I know all about your quest, punk. When that item was first stolen, Zeus sent his best out looking for it. Apollo, Athena, Artemis and me. Naturally, 
if i couldn't sniff out a weapon that if i couldn't sniff out a weapon that powerful he licked his lip lips as if they were the thought of master bowl made him hungry well if i couldn't find it you got no hope nevertheless i'm trying to give you the benefit of the doubt your dad and i go away back go way back after all i am the one who told him my suspicions about old cop's bed you told him he stole the bolt sure framing somebody to start a war oldest trick in the book i recognized it immediately in a way you got me to thank you thank for your little quest thanks i grumbled hey i'm a generous guy just do my little job and i'll help you on your way i'll arrange a ride west for you and your friends we are doing fine on your on our own you are right no money no wheels no clue what you are up against help me out and maybe i'll tell you something you need to know something about your mom my mom he grinned that got your attention the water park is a mile west on delancy you can't miss it look for the tunnel of love ride what what interrupted your date i asked something scary of aries bared his teeth but i had seen the threatening look be- before on clarice's there was something false about it almost like he was nervous you are l- lucky you m- met me you are lucky you met me punk and not one of the other olympians they're not as forgiving of rudeness as i am I'll, i'll meet you back here when you're done don't disappoint me after that i must have fainted or fallen into a trance because when i opened my eyes again eris was gone i might have thought the expression told me otherwise not good grover said eris sought you out percy this is not good I stared out the window. The motorcycle had disappeared. Did Eddie? Did Eddie really know something about my mom? <clears throat> or he just? Or he was just playing with me? Now that he was gone, all the anger drained out of me. I realized Eddie's must love to mess up with people's emotions. That was his power. Cranking up the passions so badly, they clouded your ability to think. It's probably some kind of trick, I said. Forget Eddie's. Let's just go. We can't, Annabeth said. Look, I hate Ares as much as anybody, but you can't ignore the gods unless you want to see his bad fortune. He wasn't kidding about turning you into a rodent. I looked down at my cheeseburgers, which suddenly seemed didn't seem appetizing. Why does he need us? Maybe it's a problem that requires brains, Annabeth said. Ares had strength. That's all he has. Even strength has to bow. to wisdom sometimes but this water park he acted almost scared what would make a wall god run away like that annabeth and grover glanced nervously at each other annabeth said i am afraid we'll have to find out the sun was sinking behind the mountains by the time we found the water park judging from the sign it once had been called waterland but now some of the letters were smashed out so it read what rad The main gate was padlocked and topped with barbed wire. Inside, huge dry water slides and tubes and pipes curled everywhere, leading to empty pools. Old tickets and advertisements flutter around the asphalt. With night coming on, the place looks sad and creepy. If Eric brings his girlfriend here for a date, I said, staring up at the barbed wire, I'd hate to see what she looks like. Percy, Annabeth warned. Warned, be more respectful. Why? I thought you hated Aries. He's still a god, and his girlfriend is very tem- temperamental. You don't want to insult her looks, Grover added. Who is she? Echidna. Echidna? No, Aphrodite. Grover said a little dreamily. Goddess of love. I thought she I thought she was married to somebody I said Hephaestus What's your point he asked Oh I suddenly felt the need to change the subject 
So how do we get in? Maya, grower shoes, sprouted wings. He flew over the fence, did a unintended somersault in midair, then stumbled on a landing on the opposite side. He dusted off his jeans as if he had planned the whole thing. You guys coming? Anubit and I had I had to climb the old fashioned way, holding down the barbed wire for each other as we crawled over the top. The shadow grew longer as we walked through the park, checking out the attractions. There was an uncle biter island, head over veggie, and dude, where's my swimsuit? No man no monster came to get us. Nothing made the slightest noise. We made our souvenir shop. We found a souvenir shop that had been left open. Merchandise still lined the shelves. Snow globes, pencils, postcards and racks of clothes, Annabeth said. Fresh clothes. Yeah, I said. But you can't just watch me. She snatched an entire row of stuff on the racks and disappeared into the changing room. A few minutes later, she came out in waterland flower, flower print shorts, a big red waterland t-shirt, and commemorative waterland surf shoes. A waterland backpack was slung over her shoulder, obviously stuffed with more goodies. What the heck? Grover shocked. Soon, all three of us were decked out like walking advertisements for defunct theme park. We continued searching for the tunnel of love. I got the feeling the whole park was holding its breath. So Eri's an Aphrodite, I said, to keep my mound, mind off growing dark. They have a thing going. That's old gossip, Percy, Anba told me. 3,000 year old gossip. What about Aphrodite's husband? Well, you know, she said. Hephaestus, the blacksmith, he was crippled when he was a baby, thrown off Mount Olympus. By Zeus. So he, he, is, he isn't exactly handsome, clever with his hands and all, but Aphrodite isn't into brains and talent, you know. She likes bikers, whatever. Hephaestus knows. Oh, sure, Annabeth said. He caught them together once. I mean, literally caught them in a golden net and invited all the gods to come and laugh at them. Hephaestus is always trying to embarrass them. That's why they meet in out-of-way places, like... She stopped looking straight ahead. Like that. In front of us was an empty pool that would have been awesome for skateboarding. It was at least 50 yards across the sh- across and shaped like a ball. Around the rim, a, bronze, a dozen bronze statues of Cupid stood guard with wings spread and bows ready to fire. On the opposite side from us, a tunnel opened up, probably where... The water flowed into the, into when the pool, pool, pool was full. The sign above it read, Thrill ride, O love. This is not your parents' tunnel of love. Grover crept towards theirs. Guys, look! Marooned at the bottom of the petrol was a pink and white two-seater boat with a canopy over the top and little hearts painted all over it. In the left seat, glinting in the fading light, was Aries's shield. A polished circle of bronze. This is too easy, I said. So we just walk down there and get it? And Abit ran her fingers aga- along the base of the nearest Cupid statue. There's a Greek letter carved in. Eta. I wonder. Grover, I said. You smell any monsters? He sniffed the wind. Nothing. Nothing. Like in, like in the ark and you didn't smell Chidna, nothing. Or really nothing. Grover looked hurt. I told you that was underground. Underground. Okay, I'm sorry. I took a deep breath. I'm going down there. I'll go with you. Grover didn't sound too enthusiastic. But I got the feeling he was trying to make up for what had happened in St. Louis. No, I told him. I want you to stay up with the flying shoes. You are the Red Baron. A flying ace, remember? I'll be caught counting on you for backup in case something goes wrong. Grover puffed up his chest a little. Sure, but what could go wrong? I don't know, just a feeling. Annabeth, come with me. Are you kidding? She looked at me as if I had just dropped from moon. Her cheeks were bright red. 
What's the problem now? I demanded. Me, go with you to the thrill light, thrill ride of love. How embarrassing is that? What if somebody saw us? Who's going to see you? But my face was burning now too. Leave it to a girl to make everything complicated. Fine, I told her. I'll do it myself. But when I started down the side of the pool, she followed me, muttering about how how boys always messed up things. We reached the boat. The shield was propped no one on one seat, and next to it was Lady's silk scarf. I tried to imagine Ares and Aphrodite here, a couple of gods meeting in a junked-out amusement park ride. Why? Then I noticed something I hadn't seen from up top: mirrors all the way from the rim, around the rim of the pool, facing this spot. We could see ourselves no matter which direction we took. That must be it. While Ares and Aphrodite were smooching with each other, they could look at their favorite people themselves. I picked up the scarf; it shimmered pink, and the perfume was indescribable. Rose or mountain laurel, something good. I smiled a little dreamy and was about to wrap the scarf against my cheek when Annabeth ripped it out of my hands and stuffed it in her pocket. Oh no! You don't stay away. You don't stay away from the love magic. What? Just get the shield, seaweed brain, and let's get out of here. The moment I touched the shield, I knew we were in trouble. My hands broke through something that hadn't been connected to the dashboard—a cobweb. I thought, but I looked at the strand of it in on my palm and saw it, it was some kind of metal filament, so fine it was almost invisible. A trip wire. Wait, Annabeth said. Too late. Too late. There's another. There's another Greek letter on the side of the boat. Another Eta. This is a trap. Now it's erupted all around us, of a million gears, grinding as if the pool were turning into a giant machine. Grover yelped. Guys. Up on the rim, the Cupid statues were drawing their bows into firing position. Before I could suggest taking cover, they shot. They shot, but not at us. They fired at each other across the rim of the pool. Silk cables trailed from the arrows, arcing over the pool and anchoring where they landed to form a huge golden astronic. The smaller, then smaller metallic threads started weaving together magically between the main strands. Making a net. We have to get out. I said. Duh, Annabeth said. I grabbed the shield and we ran, but going up the slope of the pool was not as easy as going down. Come on, Grover shouted. He was trying to get hold, open a section for the net, of the net for us. But whenever we touched it, the golden threads started to wrap around his hands. The cupids he heads. Popped open. Out came video cameras, spotlight, spotlights. Rose up all around the pool, blinding us with illumination. The lights, the loudspeaker voice boomed. Life to Olympus in one minute, fifty nine seconds, fifty eight. Hephaestus, Annabeth screamed. I'm so stupid. Eta is H. He made the strap to catch his wife with Ares. Now we are going to be broadcast to Olympus and look like absolute fools. We'd almost made it to the rim when the row of mirrors opened like hatches, and thousands of tiny metallic things poured out. Annabeth screamed. It was an army of wind-up, creepy crawlies, bronze gear bodies, spindly legs, like pincer mouths, all scuttling towards us in a wave of clacking, veering metal. Spiders! Annabeth said. Sp, sp. I've never seen her like this before. She fell backward in terror and almost got over- overwhelmed by the spider robots. Before I pulled her up and dragged her back towards the boat, the things were coming up, coming out from all around the rim. Now millions of them, flooding towards the center of the pool, completely surrounding us. I told myself they probably weren't programmed to kill, just cor- coral and bite us. And made us look stupid. Then again, this was a trap meant for gods, and we weren't gods. Annabeth and I climbed into the boat. 
I started kicking away the spiders as they swarmed both. I yelled at Annabelle to help me, but she was too paralyzed to do much more than scream. Twenty, thirty-nine, sorry, thirty, twenty-nine. Called the loudspeaker. The spiders started spitting out strands of metal threads, trying to tie us down. The strands were easy enough to break at first, but there were so many of them that the spiders just kept coming. I kicked one away from Annabeth's leg, and its pincers took a chunk of my new scarf, my new surf shoe. Grover hovered above the pool in his flying sneakers, trying to pull the net loose, but it wouldn't budge. Think, I told myself. Think. The tunnel of love entrance was under the net. We could use it as an exit. Except it was blocked by a million robot spiders. Fifteen, fourteen, thirteen. The loudspeaker called. Water, I thought. Where does the right water come from? Then I saw them, huge water pipes behind the mirrors, where the spiders had come from. And up above the net, next to one of the cupids, a glass windowed booth that must be the controller station. Grover, I yelled. Get into the booth. Find the on switch, but do it. It was crazy. It was a crazy hope, but there was, but it was our only chance. The spiders were all over the pro, pro of the boat now. Annabeth was screaming her head off. I had to get us out of there. Grover was in the controller's booth now, slamming away the buttons. Grover, five, four. Grover looked up at me hopelessly, raising his hands. He was letting me know that he had pushed every button, but still nothing was happening. I closed my eyes and thought about the waves rushing water, the Mississippi River. I felt a familiar tug in my gut. I tried to imagine that I was dragging the ocean all the way to Denver. Two, one, zero. Water exploded out of the pipes. It roared into the pool, sweeping away the spiders. I pulled Annabeth into the seat next to me and fastened her seat belt just as the tidal wave slammed into our boat. Over the top, whisking the spiders away and dousing us completely, but not capsizing us, the boat turned, lifted in the flood, and spun in circles r- around the whirlpool. The water was full of short-circuiting cir- spiders. Some of them smashing against the pool's concrete wall with such force they burst. Spotlights glared down at us. The cupid cams were rolling life to Olympus, but I could only concentrate on controlling the boat. I willed it to ride on my current to keep away from the wall. Maybe it was my my imagination, but the boat seemed to respond. At least it didn't break into a million pieces. We spun around one last time. The water level now almost high enough to shred us against the metal net. Then the boat's nose turned towards the tun- tunnel, and we rocketed through into the darkness. Annabeth and I. Ta- held tight, both of us screaming as the boat shot curls and hugged corners and took forty-five degree plunges past pictures of Romeo and Juliet and a bunch of other Valentine Day stuff. Then, then we were out of the tunnel. The night's air whistled through the, through our hair, as the boat barreled straight towards the exit. If the ride hadn't been in working order, we would have sailed off a ramp between the golden gates of love. And splashed down safely in the exit pool, but there was a problem. The gates of love, but the gates of love was chained. Two boats had just been washed out of the tunnel before we were now piled against the barricade. One submerged, another cracked up in half. Unfasten your seat belt! I yelled to Annabeth. Are you crazy? Unless you want to get smashed to death, I strapped Eddie's shield to my arm. We were going to have to jump for it. We were going to have to jump for it. My idea was simple and insane. As the boat struck, we could, we would use its force like springboard to jump the gate. I'd help. I'd heard the people, sur- surviving car crashes, the way getting thrown thirty or forty feet away from an accident. With lucky, we would land in a pool. And but seemed to understand. She gripped my hand at the gates, got closer. On my mark, I said. No, on my mark. What? Simple physics! She yelled. Four times the trajectory angle. Fine! I shouted. On your mark. She hesitated, hesitated, then yelled. Now, crack! Annabeth was right. If we had jumped when I thought we should have, 
We would have crashed in, crashed into the gates. She got us maximum lift. Unfortunately, that was a little more than we needed. Our boat smashed into the pileup, and we were thrown into the air, straight over the gates, over the pool, and down towards the solid asphalt. Something grabbed me from behind. Annabeth yelled, "Ouch!" Grover. In mid-air, he had grabbed me by the shirt and Annabeth by the arm, and was trying to pull us out of crash landing. But Annabeth and I had momentum. You were too heavy, Grover said. We are going down. We spiraled towards the ground. Grover, doing his best to slow his fall, we smashed into a photo booth. Photo board. Grover's head going straight into the hole where tourists would put their faces, pretending to be new, new, the friendly way. Annabeth and I stumbled to the ground, banged up but alive. Aries's shield was still on my arm. Once we caught our breath, Annabeth and I got Grover out of the photo board and thanked him for saving our lives. I looked back at the thr- thrill ride of love. The water was subsiding. Our boat had been smashed into pieces against the gates. A hundred yards away, the entrance pool, the cupids were still filming. The statues have swiveled to their cameras, were trained straight on us, the, spot- the spotlights in our faces. Show's over, I yelled. Thank you. Good night. The cupids turned back to the original pos- positions. The light shut off. The park went quiet and dark again, except for the gentle trickle of water into the thrill ride of love. Exit pool. I wondered if Olympus had gone to the commercial park break or if our ratings had been any good i hated being teased i hated being tricked and i had plenty of experience handling bullies who liked to do that stuff to me i hefted the shield on my arm and turned to my friends we need to have a little talk with aries chapter 16 we take a zebra we take a zebra to vegas the war god was waiting for us in dinner parking lot well well he said You didn't get yourself killed. You know, it was you knew it was a trap, I said. Aries gave me a wicked grin. Pet that crippled blacksmith was surprised when he netted a couple of stupid kids. You looked good on TV. I shoved his shield at him. You're a jerk. Annabeth and Grover caught their breath. Aries grabbed the shield and spun it in the air like pizza dough. It changed from melting into a bullet It changed form, melting into a bulletproof vest. He slung it across his black back. See that truck over there? He pointed at the 18 wheeler park parked across the street from the diner. That that's your ride. Take your that's your ride. Take you straight to LA with one stop in Vegas. The 18 wheeler had a sign on the back which I could only read because it was reverse printed white. on black a good combination for dyslexia kindness international human zoo transport warning L- live wild animals i said you're kidding he snapped his fingers the back door of the truck unlatched free ride west punk stop complaining and here's a little something for doing the job he slung a blue nylon backpack off his and this and tossed it to me inside were fresh clothes for all of us 20 bucks in cash a pouch full of golden drachmas and a bag of double stuff oreos i said i don't want your lousy thank you lord aries grover interrupted giving giving me his best red alert warning look thanks a lot i gritted my teeth it was probably a deadly insult to refuse something from a god But I didn't want anything that Aries had touched. Reluctantly, I slung the bag over my shoulders. I knew my anger was being caused by the war god's presence, but I was still itching to punch him in the nose. He reminded me of every bully I had ever faced: Nancy, Boba Fett, Clarice, Smelly Gabe, sarcastic teachers. Every jerk who had called me stupid in school or laughed at me when I had gotten expelled. I looked back at the diner, which had only a couple of customers now. The waitress who had served us dinner was watching nervously out of the window, like she was afraid Aries might hurt her. She dragged the fry cook out from the kitchen to see. She said something to him. He nodded, held up a disposal camera, and snapped the pictures of us. Great, 
I thought. We'll make the papers again tomorrow. I imagine the headline. 12-year-old outlaw beats up defenseless biker. You owe me, you owe me one more thing, I told Aries, trying to keep my voice level. You promised me information about my mother. You sure you can handle the news? He kick-started his motorcycle. She's not dead. The ground seemed to spin beneath me. What do you mean? I mean, she was taken away from the Minotaur before she was, she could die. She was turned into a shower of cold, right? That's a metamorphosis. Not death. She's being kept. Kept? Why? You need to study war, punk. Hostages. You take somebody to control somebody else. Nobody's controlling me. He laughed. Oh, yeah? See you around, kid. I balled up my fists. You're pretty smug, Lord Aries, for a guy who runs from Cupid statues. Behind his glasses, fire glowed. I felt a hot wind in my hair. We'll meet again, Percy Jackson. Next time you're in a fight, watch your back. He revved his hardly, then roared off down Delancey Street. Annabeth said, That's not smart, Percy. I don't care. You don't want a god as your enemy, especially not that god. Hey guys, Grover said. I hate to interrupt, but he pointed towards the diner. At the register, the last two customers were paying their check. Two men in identical black coveralls with a white logo on their backs that matched if one of matched the one of the kindness international truck. If we are taking the zoo express, Grover said, we need to hurry. I didn't like it, but we had no better option. Besides, I'd seen enough of Denver. We ran across the street and climbed in the back of the big rig, closing the doors behind us. The first thing that hit me was the smell. It was like the world's biggest pan of kitty litter. The trail was dark inside until I encaped Riptide. The blade cast a faint bronze light over a very sad scene. Sitting in a row of filthy metal cages were three of the most pathetic zoo animals I'd ever beheld. A zebra, a male alpino lion, and some weird antelope thing I didn't know the name for. Someone had thrown the lion a sack of turnips, which he obviously didn't want to eat. The zebra and the antelope each had got a styrofoam tray of hamburger meat. The zebra's mane was mated with chewing gum, like somebody had been spitting on it in their spare time. The antelope had a stupid silver birthday balloon tied to one of his horns, red, over the hill. Apparently, nobody had wanted to get close enough to the lion to mess with him, but the poor thing was pacing around on solid blankets in a space way too smell small for him, panting from the scuffy heat of the trailer. He had flies buzzing around his pink eyes, and his ribs showed through his white fur. This is kindness, Grover yelled. You mean zoo transport? He probably would have gone right back outside to beat up the truckers with his reed pipes and I would have helped him. But just then the truck's engine roared to life. The trailer started shaking and we were forced to sit down or fall down. We huddled in the corner on some mild wheat fleet sacks, trying to ignore the smell and the heat and the flies. Grover talked to the animals in a series of groat bleats, but they just stared at him sadly. Annabeth was in favor of breaking the cages and freeing them on spot, but I pointed out it wouldn't do much good until the truck stopped moving because I had a feeling we might look a lot better to the lion than those turnips. I found a water jug and refilled their bowels, then used riptide to drag the mismatched food out of their cages. I gave the meat to the lion and the turnips to the zebra and the antelope. Grover calmed the antelope down while Annabeth used her knife to cut the balloon off his knob, of his horn. She wanted to cut the gum out of the zebra's mane too, but we decided that would be too risky, with the trunk bumping around. We told Grover to promise the animals we had helped them more in the morning when we settled in for night. Grover curled upon a turnip sack. Annabeth opened our bags of double stuffed Oreos and nibbled on one half-heartedly. I tried to cheer myself 
by concentrating on the fact that we are halfway to Los Angeles, halfway to our destination. It was only for Jul- June 14th. The solstice wasn't until the 21st. We could make it in plenty of time. On the other hand, I had no idea what to expect next. The gods kept toying, toying with me. At least Hephaestus had the decency to be honest about it. He had put up cameras and advertised me as entertainment. But even when the cameras weren't rolling, I had a feeling my quest was being watched. I was a source of amusement for the gods. Hey, Annabeth said. I'm sorry for freaking out back at the water park, Percy. That's okay. It just... She shuddered. Spiders. Because of Arachne's story, I guessed. She got turned into a spider for challenging your mom to a viewing contest, right? Annabeth nodded. Arachne chil- Arachne's children have been taking revenge on the child of Athena ever since. If there is a spider within a mile of me, it will find me. I hate the creepy little things. Anyway, I owe you. We are a, t- we are a team. We are a team, remember? I said. Besides, Grover did the fancy flying. I thought he was asleep, but he mumbled from the corner. I was pretty amazing, wasn't I? Annabeth and I laughed. She pulled about an Oreo, handed me half. In the iris message, did did Luke really say nothing? I munched my cookie and thought about how to answer. The conversation via rainbow had bothered me all evening. Luke said you and he go way back. He also said Grover wouldn't fail this time. Nobody would turn into a pine tree. In the dim bronze light of the sword blade, it was hard to read the expressions. Grover let out a mournful bray. I should have told you the truth from the beginning, his voice trembled. I thought if you knew what a failure I was, you wouldn't want me along. You were the sat you were the satyr who tried to rescue Tal- Talia, the daughter of Zeus? He nodded glumly, and the other two half bloods Talia befriended the ones who got safely at camp. I looked at Annabeth. That was you and Luke, wasn't it? She put down her Oreo uneaten. Like you said, Percy, a seven-year-old half-blood wouldn't have made it far alone. Athena guided towards he- guided me towards help. Talia was twelve. Luke was fourteen. They both they had both run away from home, like me. They were happy to take me with them. They were amazing monster fighters. Even without training, we travelled north from Virginia. Without any real plans, fending off monsters for about two weeks before Grover found us. I was supposed to escort Ta- Talia to camp, he said, sniffling. Only Talia. I had strict orders from Kyron. Don't do anything that would slow you down, the res- slow down the rescue. We knew Hades was after her. See, but I couldn't just leave Luke and Annabeth by themselves. I thought, I thought I could lead all three of them to safety. It was my fault. The kindly ones caught up with us. I froze. I got scared on the way back to the camp and took some wrong turns. If I had just been a little quicker... Stop it, Annabeth said. No one blames you. Talia didn't blame you either. She sacrificed herself to save us, he said miserably. Her death was my fault. The Council of Cloven Elders said so. Because you wouldn't let two other half-bloods behind? I said, that's not fair. Percy's right, Annabeth said. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for you, Grover. Neither would Luke. We wouldn't care that the, what the council says. Grover kept sniffling in the dark. It's just my luck. I'm the lamest satyr ever. And I find the two most powerful half buds in the century. Dahlia and Percy. You're not lame, Annabeth insisted. You've got more courage than any satyr I've ever met. Name one another who would dare to go to Underworld. I bet Percy's really glad you're here right now. She kicked me in the shin. Yeah, I said, which I, which I would have done without the kick. It's not the luck that you found, Talia and me, Grover. You've got the biggest heart of any satyr ever. You are natural searcher. That's why you'll be the one who finds Pan. I heard a deep, satisfied sigh. I waited for Grover to say something, but his breathing only got heavier. 
when the sound turned to snoring. I realized he had fallen asleep. How does he do that? I marveled. I don't know, Annabeth said. But that was a really nice thing you told him. I meant it. We rode in silence for a few miles, bumping around on the feed sacks. The zebra munched a turnip. The lion licked the last of the hamburger's meat off his lips and looked at me hopefully. Annabeth rubbed her necklace. She was thinking deep strategic thoughts. The pine tree, the pine tree beat. I said, it's from the first year. She looked. She, reali- she hadn't realized what she was doing. Yeah, she said. Every August, the counselor. Every August, the counselor picked the most important event of the summer and they painted on the five years beads. I've got Talia's pine tree, a Greek trireme on fire, a centaur in prom dress. Now that was a weird summer, and the co- and the college ring is is your father's. That's none of your. She stopped herself. Yeah, yeah, it is. You don't have to tell me. No, it's okay. She took a shaky breath. My dad sent it to me, folded up in a letter, two summers ago. The ring was like his main keepsake from Athena. He wouldn't have got it through the doctoral program at Harvard without her. That's a long story. Anyway, he said he wanted me to have it. He apologized for being a jerk. Said he loved me and missed me. He wanted me to come home and live with him. That doesn't sound bad. Yeah, well, the problem was I believed him. I tried to go home for the school year. But my stepmom was the same as ever. She didn't want her kids put in danger by living with a freak. Monsters attacked. We argued. Monsters attacked. We argued. I didn't even make it through winter break. I called Kyren and came right back to Camp Halfland. Do you think you'll ever try living with your dad again? She wouldn't meet my eyes. Please. I'm not into self-inflicted pain. You shouldn't give up. I told her, you should write him a letter or something. Thanks for the advice, she said coldly. But my father, but my father made his choice about who he wants to live with. We passed another few miles of silence. So if the gods fight, I said, will things line up the way they did with the Trojan War? Will it be Athena versus Poseidon? She put her head against the backpacks Ares had given him us and closed her eyes. I don't know what I don't know what my mom will do. I just know I'll fight next to you. Why? Because you're my friend, seaweed brain. Any more stupid questions? I couldn't think of an answer for that. Fortunately, I didn't have to. Annabeth was asleep. I had trouble following her example, with Grover snoring, and a and an albino lion staring hungrily at me. But even, but eventually, I closed my eyes. My nightmare was something I dreamed a million times before. I was being forced to take a standardized test while wearing a st- straight jacket. All the other kids were going out to recess, and the teacher kept saying, "Come on, Percy, you're not stupid, are you? Pick up your pencil." Then the dream stayed for the usual. I looked over at the next j- desk and saw a girl sitting there, also wearing a straight jacket. She was my age, with unnerly black, punky style hair, dark eyeliner around her stormy green eyes, and freckles across her nose. Somehow, I knew who she was. She was Thalia, daughter of Zeus. She struggled against the straight jacket, glared at me in frustration, and snapped, "Well, seaweed brain, one of us has to get out of here." She's right. My dream self thought. I'm going back to the cavern. I'm going to give Hades a piece of my mind. The straight jacket melted off me. I fell to the classroom, and the teacher's voice changed until it was cold and evil, echoing from the depths of a great chasm. Percy Jackson, it said. Yes, the exchange went well. I see. I was back in the dark, dark cavern. Spirits <coughs> of death drifting around me. Unseen in the pit, the monstrous thing 
was speaking, but his but this time it wasn't addressing me. The numbing power of its voice seemed directly some some directed somewhere else. And he suspects nothing? It asked. Another voice, one I almost recognized, answered at my shoulder. Nothing, my lord. He is an ignorant as the rest. I looked over, but no one was there. The speaker was invisible. Deception upon deception. The thing in the pit mused aloud. Excellent. Truly, my lord, said the voice next to me. You are well named, the crooked one. But was it really necessary? I could have brought you what I stole directly. You, the monster said in scorn. You have already shown your limits. You have failed me completely, had I not intervened. But my lord, peace, little servant, our six months have bought us much. Zeus's anger has grown. Poseidon has placed with his most desperate card. Now we shall use it against him. Shortly you shall have the reward you wished, and your revenge, as soon as both items are delivered into my hand. But wait, he is here. What? The invisible ser- servant suddenly sounded tensed. You summoned him, my lord. No, the full force of the monster's attention was now pouring over me, freezing me in place. Blast his father's blood. He's too changeable, too unpredictable. The boy brought himself either. Impossible, the servant cried. For a weakling such as you, perhaps. The wife snarled, and its cold power turned back on me. So, you wish to dream of your quest, young half-blood? Then I will oblige. The scene changed. I was standing in vast throne room with black marble walls and bronze floors. The empty horrid throne was made from human bones, fused together. Standing at the foot of the dais was my mother, frozen in shimmering golden lights, her arm outstretched. I tried to step toward her, but my legs wouldn't move. I reached for her, only to realize that my hands were withering to bones. Grinning, grinning skeletons in Greek armor crowded around me, draping me with silk robes, weathering my head with laurels and smoked. The evil voice began to laugh. Hail the conquering hero! I woke with a start. Grover was shaking my shoulder. The truck stopped, he said. We think they are coming back to check on the animals. Hide! Annabeth hissed. She had it easy. She just put on her magic cap and disappeared. Grover and I had to dive behind feed sacks and hope we looked like turnips. The trailer doors cracked open. Sunlight and heat poured in. Man, one of the truckers said, waving his hands in front of his ugly nose. I wish I hauled appliances. He climbed inside and poured some water from the jug into the animal's dishes. You hot big boy? He asked the lion, then splashed the rest of the bucket right in lion's face. The lion roared in indication. Yeah, 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 the man said. Next to me under the turnip snack, sacks, Grover tensed for a peace-loving herbivore. He looked downright murderous. The trucker threw the antelope a squashy-looking Happy Meal bag. He smirked at Zebra. How you doing, Stripes? Least we'll be getting rid of you this stop. You like magic shows? You gonna love this one? They're... They're gonna saw you in half. The zebra wild eyed with fear looked straight at me. There was no sound but as clear as day. I heard it say, Free me, Lord, please. I was too stunned to react. There was a loud knock, knock, knock on the side of the trailer. The trucker inside with us yelled, What do you want, Eddie? A voice outside, it must have been Eddie's, shouted back, Morris, what do you say? What are you banging for? Knock, knock, knock. Outside, Eddie yelled. What banging? Our guy Morris rolled his eye and went back outside, cursing at Eddie for being an idiot. A second later, Annabeth appeared next to me. She must have done the banging to get Morris out of the trailer. She said, This, tra- this transport business can't be legal. No kidding, Grover said. He paused as if listening. The lion says these guys are animal smugglers. That's right. Th- that's right, the zebra's voice said in my mind. We've got to free them, Grover said. He and Annabeth both looked at me, waiting for my lead. 
I'd heard the zebra talk, but not the lion. Why? Maybe it was another learning disability. I could only understand zebras. Then I thought horses. What had Annabeth said about Poseidon? Creating horses. Was the zebra close enough to a horse? Was that why I could understand it? The zebra said, Open my cage, Lord, please. I'll be fine after that. Outside, Eddie and Morris were still yelling at each other. But I knew they'd be coming inside to torment the animals again any minute. I grabbed Riptide and slashed the lock of the zebra's cage. The zebra burst out. I turned, it turned to me and bowed. Thank you, Lord. Crow held up his hands and said something to the zebra in goat talk like a blessing. Just as Morris was poking his head back inside to check out the noise, the zebra leaped over him and into the street. There was yelling and screaming and cars honking. We rushed to the doors of the trailer in time to see the zebra galloping down a wide pillowed lane with hotels and casinos and neon signs. We had just released a zebra in Las Vegas. Morris and Hedy ran after it with a few policemen running after them, shouting, Hey, you need a permit for that. Now would be a good time now would be a good time to leave, Annabeth said. The other animals first, Grover said. I cut the locks with my sword. Grover raises his hands and spoke the same growth blessing he had used for the zebra. Good luck, I told the animals. The antelope and the lion burst out of the cages and went off together in the streets. Some tourists screamed. Most just backed off and took pictures, probably thinking it was some kind of stunt by one of the casinos. While the a- Will the animals be okay? I asked Grover. I mean, the desert and all. Don't worry, he said. I placed a satyr's sanctuary on them. Meaning? Meaning they'll reach the wild safely. They'll find water, food, shade, whatever they need until they find a safe place to live. Why can't you place a blessing like that on us? I asked. It only works for wild animals. So it would so it would only affect Percy, Annabeth reasoned. Hey, I protested. Kidding, she said. Come on, let's get out of this fi- filthy truck. She stumbled out in the dark, in the desert afternoon. It was a hundred and ten degrees easy. We must have looked like deep fried vagrants, but everybody was too interested in the wild animals to pay much attention at us. We paced the Monte Carlo and the MGM. We passed pyramids, a, a pirate ship, and the Statue of Liberty, which a, which was a pretty small replica, but still made me homesick. I was unsure. What we were looking for, maybe just a place to get out of the heat for a few minutes, find a sandwich and a glass of lemon, take a few, take a new plan for getting west. We must have taken a wrong turn because we found ourselves at dead end, standing in front of the Lotus Hotel and Casino. The entrance was so huge, no one was going in or out, but the glittering chrome doors were opening, spilling out air conditioning and the smell like flowers. Lotus blossom, maybe. I have never smelled one, so I wasn't sure. The doorman smiled at us. Hey, kids, you look tired. You want to come in and sit down? I, I learned to be suspicious the last week or so. I figured anybody might be a monster or a god. You just couldn't tell. But this guy was so normal, one look at him, and I could see. Besides, I was so relieved to hear somebody who sounded sympathetic, and I nodded and said, we'd love to come inside. We took one look around, and Grover said, whoa, the whole lobby was a giant game room, and I'm not talking about cheesy old Pac-Man games or slot machines. There was an indoor water slide snaking around the glass elevator, which went straight up at at least 40 feet. There was a climbing wall on the side of the build, building and an indoor bungee jumping bridge. There were virtual reality suits with working laser guns and hundreds of video games each one of the, each one of the size of widescreen TV. Basically you name it this place had it. There were a few other kids playing but not many. No waiting for any of the games. There were waitresses and snack bars all around serving everybody with food. Hey a bellhop said. At least I guessed it was a bellhop. He wore a white and yellow Hawaiian shirt with lotus 
design shots and flip flops. Welcome to look this casino. Here's your room key. I stammered. Um, but no, no, he said, laughing. The bill's taken care of. No extra charges, no tips. Just go on up to the top floor, room four, four zero zero one. If you need anything, a little extra bubbles for the hot pot, hot ta, hot tub, or skeet targets for the shooting range, or whatever, just call the front desk. Here are your Lotus cash cards. They work in the restaurant and on all the ga- games and rides. He handed each us a green plastic credit card. I knew there must be some kind of mistake. Obviously, he thought we were millionaires, millionaires, kids. But I took the card and said, "How much is on here?" His eyebrows knit together. What do you mean? I mean, when does it run out of cash? He laughed. Oh, you're making a joke. Hey, that's cool. Enjoy your stay. We took the elevator up. We took the elevator upstairs and checked out our room. It was a suite with three separate rooms and a bar. Stocked with candy, sodas, and chips, a hot line of rooms service, fluffy towels, and water bed with filled pillows, a big screen television with satellite and high-speed internet. The balcony had its own ba- hot tub, and sure enough, there had was a skeet shooting machine and a shotgun, so you could launch clay pigeons right out over the Las Vegas skyline and plunge them with your gun. I didn't see how that could be legal, but I thought it was pretty cool. The view over the strip and the desert was amazing, though I doubted we had ever find time to look at the view with the room like this. Oh goodness, Annabeth said. This place is sweet. Grover said, absolutely sweet. There were clothes in the closet, and they fit me. I frowned, thinking that this was a little strange. I threw Aries backpack in the trash can. Wouldn't need that any more. When he left, I could just charge a new one at the hotel store. I took a shower, which felt awesome after a week of creamy traveling. I changed clothes, ate a bag of chips, drank three cokes, and came out feeling better than I had in a long time. In the back of my mind, some small problem kept nagging me. I'd had a dream or something. I needed to talk to my friends, but I was sure it could wait. I came out of the bedroom and found that Annabeth and Grover had also showered and changed into clothes. Grover was eating potato chips in his heart's content while Annabeth cranked up the National Geography Channel. All those stations, I told her, and you turn on National Geography? Are you insane? It's interesting. I feel good, Grover said. I love this place. Without even realizing it. The wings sprouted out of his shoes and lifted him off foot of the ground, then back down again. So what now? She asked. Annabeth asked. Sleep? Grover and I looked at each other and grinned. We both held our green plastic lotus cash card. Play time, I said. I couldn't remember the last time I had so much fun. I came from a relatively poor family. Our idea of a splurge was eating out at Burger King and renting a video, a five-star Vegas hotel. Forget it. I, I bungee jumped the lobby five or six times, did the water slide, sn- snowboarded the artificial ski slope, and played virtual reality laser tag and FBI sharpshooter. I saw Grover a few times going from game to game. He really liked the reverse hunter thing. There was a deer go out and shoot the. Rednecks. I saw Annabeth playing trivia games and other brain brainiac stuff. They had this th- huge three D sim game where you build your own city, and you could dis and you could actually see the holographic graph buildings arise on the display board. I didn't think much of it, but Annabeth loved it. I'm not sure where I first realized something was wrong. Probably it was when I noticed the guy standing next to me at VR sharpshooters. He was about thirteen, I guessed. But his clothes were weird. I thought he was some Elvis impersonator's son. He wore bell-bottom jeans and a red T-shirt with black piping, piping, and his hair permed and gelled like a New Jersey girl's on homecoming night. He played a game of sharpshoot. We played a game of sharpshooters together, and he said, "Groovy man, been there two weeks, and the games keep getting better and better. Groovy." Later, while we were talking, I said, 
something was sick and he looked at me kind of startled as if he had never heard the word used that way before he said his name was darren but as soon as i started asking him question he got bored with me and started to go back to the computer screen i said hey darren what what year is it he frowned at me in the game no in real life he had to think about it 1977 no i said getting a little scared really hey man bad vibes vibes i got a game happening after that he totally ignored me i started talking to people and i found it wasn't easy they were glued to the tv screen or the video game or their food or whatever i found a guy who told me it was 1985 another guy who told me it was 1993 they all claimed they hadn't been here very long a few days a few weeks at most they didn't really know and they didn't care then it occurred to me how long had i been here it seemed like only a couple of hours but was it i tried to remember why we were here we are going to los angeles we were supposed to find the entrance to the underworld my mother for a scary second i had trouble remembering her name sally sally jackson i had to find her i had to stop hades from causing world war 3 i found annabeth still building a city come on i told her we've got to get out of here no response i shook her annabeth she looked up annoyed what we need to leave leave what are you talking about i've just got the towers this place is a trap she didn't respond until i shook her again what Listen, the underworld, our quest. Oh, come on, Percy! Just a few more minutes. Annabeth, there are people from nineteen seventy-seven. Kids who have never aged. You check in and you stay forever. So, she asked, "Can you imagine a better place?" I grabbed her wrist and yanked her away from the game. Hey! She screamed and hit me, but nobody else even bothered looking at us. They were too busy. I made her look directly in my eyes. I said. spiders large hairy spiders that jarred her her vision cleared oh my god she said how long have we i don't know but we have got to find grover we went searching and found him still playing virtual deer hunter grover we both shouted he said tie human tie silly polluting nasty person grover we turned the plastic gun on me He turned the plastic gun on me and started clicking as if I were another image from the scheme. I looked at Annabeth and together we took Grover by the arms and dragged him away. His flying shoes sprang to life and started tugging his legs in the other direction as he shouted, "No! I just got a new level. No!" The lotus bell up buri hurried up to us. "Well now, are you ready for your platinum cards? We are leaving," I told him. Such a shame," he said, and I got a feeling that he really meant it. We were breaking his heart hard. Is if if we went, we just added for platinum card members. He held out the card, and I wanted one. I knew that if I took one, I'd never leave. I'd stay here happy forever, playing games forever, and soon I'd forget my mom and my quest, and maybe even my own name. I'd be playing playing virtual rifleman with groovy disco darren forever. Grover reached for the card, but Annabeth yanked back his arms and said, "No thanks." We walked towards the door as we did. The smell of the food and the sound of the games seemed to get more and more inviting. I thought about our room upstairs. We could just stay the night, sleep in a real bed for once. Then, then we burst through the doors of Lotus Casino and drowned and ran down the sidewalk. It felt like afternoon about the time of day we had done we had gone in the casino but something was wrong the weather had completely changed it was small stormy with heat lightning flashing out in the desert ares's backpack was slung over my shoulder which was odd because i was sure i had thrown it in the trash can in room 4001 but at that moment i had other problems to worry about I ran to the newest nearest newspaper stand and read the year first. Thank the God, it was the same year. It had been when we went in. Then I noticed the date, June twenty twentieth. We had been in Lotus Casino for five days. We had only one day left until the summer solstice. One day to complete our quest. We were doomed.
Chapter 17 It was Annabeth's idea. She loaded us into the back of a Vegas taxi as if we actually had money and told the driver, Los Angeles, please. The cabbie che- chewed his cigar and sized us up. That's 300 miles. For that, you gotta pay up front. You accept casino debit cards? Annabeth asked. He shrugged. Some of them. Same as credit cards. I gotta si- swipe them first. Annabeth handed him her green lotus cash cash card. He looked at it skeptically. Swipe it, Annabeth invited. He did. His meter machine started rattling. The lights flashed. Finally, an infinity symbol came up next to the dollar sign. The cigar fell out of the driver's mouth. He looked back at us, his eyes wide. Where in Los Angeles, your highness? The Santa Monica Pier. Annabeth sat up, a little straighter. I could tell she liked the Your Highness thing. Get us there fast, and you can keep the change. Maybe she shouldn't have told him that. The cab speedometer never dipped down below 95, the whole way through the Mojave Desert. On the road, we had plenty of time to talk. I told Annabeth and Grover about my latest dream, but the details got sketchier, and more I tried to the more I tried to remember them. The Lotus Casino seemed to have short-circuited my memory. I couldn't recall that what the invisible servant's voice had sounded like, though I was sure it was somebody I knew. The servant had called the monster in the pit something other than my lord. Some special name or title. The silent one? Annabeth suggested. The rich one? Both of those are nicknames for Hades. Maybe, I thought. Though, neither sounded quite right. That that throne room sounds like Hades, Grover said. That's the way it's actually described. I shook my head. Something's wrong. The throne room wasn't the main part of the dream. And that voice from the pit? I, I don't know. I just feel like a go- it, was a go- it was a god's voice. Annabeth's eyes widened. What? I asked. Oh, um, nothing. I was just... No. It has to be Hades. Maybe he sent this thief, this invisible person, to get the master bolt. And something went wrong? Like what? I I don't know, she said. But if he stole Zeus's symbol of power from Olympus, and the gods were hunting him, I mean a lot of things could go wrong. So this thief had to hide the bolt, or he lost it somehow. Anyways, he failed to bring it to Hades. That's what the wise said in your dream, right? The guy failed. That would explain what the Furies were searching for when they came after us on the bus. Maybe they thought we had retrieved the bolt. I wasn't sure what was going wrong. What was wrong with her? She looked pale. But if I had already retrieved the bolt, I said, why would I be travelling to Underworld? To threaten Hades, Grover suggested, to bribe or blackmail him into getting your mom back. I whistled. You have evil thoughts for a goat. Why, thank you. But the thing in the pit said it was waiting for two time, two items. I said, if the master bolt is one, what's the other? Grover shook his head, clearly mystified. Annabeth was looking at me as if she knew my next question and was silently willing me not to ask it. You have an idea what might be in the pit, don't you? I asked her. I mean, if it isn't Hades. Percy... Let's not talk about it. But if it isn't Hades, no. It has to be Hades. Wasteland rolled by. We passed a sign that said California State Line, 12 miles. I got the feeling I was missing one simple critical piece of information. It was like when I started at a common word. I I should know, but I couldn't make sense of it because one or two letters were floating around. The more I thought about my quest, the more I was sure that confronting Hades wasn't the real answer. There was something else going on, something probably even more dangerous. The problem was, we were hurtling towards the underworld at 95 miles an hour, be- betting that Hades had the master board. If we got there and found out we were wrong, we wouldn't have time to correct ourselves. The solstice deadline would pass and war would begin. The answer is in the underworld. Annabeth assured me. You saw spirits of dead, Percy. 
There is only one place that could be. We are doing the right thing. She tried to boost her morale by suggesting clever strat- strategies, strategies for getting into the land of dead. But my heart wasn't in it. There were just too many unknown factors. It was like cramming for a test without knowing the subject. And believe me, I've done that th- enough times. The cab sped waste. Every gust of wind through Death Valley sounded like a spirit of the dead. Every time the brakes hissed on an 18-wheeler, it reminded me of Echidna's reptilian voice. At sunset, the taxi dropped us at the beach in Santa Monica. It looked exactly the way LA beaches do in the movies, only it smelled worse. There were carnival rides lining the pyre palm trees, lining the sidewalks, homeless guys sleeping in the sand dunes, and the surfer dudes waiting for the perfect wave. Grover, Annabeth and I walked down the edge of the surf. What now? Annabeth asked. The Pacific was turning gold in the setting sun. I thought about how long it had been since I had stood on the beach at Montauk, at the opposite side of the country, looking out at a different sea. How could there be a god who would control all that? What did my science teacher used to say? Two-thirds of the earth's surface was covered in water. How could I be the son of someone that powerful? I stepped into the surf. Percy, Annabeth said, what are you doing? I kept walking up, walking up to my waist, then my chest. She called after me. You know how polluted that water is? They're all kind of toxic. (laughs) That's when my head went underwater. I held my breath at first. It's difficult to intentionally inhale water. Finally, I couldn't stand it anymore. I gasped. Sure enough, I could breathe normally. I walked down into the shoals. I, should ha- I shouldn't have been able to see through the murk, but somehow I could tell where everything was. I could sense the rolling texture of the bottom. I could make out sand dollar colonies dotting the sandbars. I could even see the currents, warm and cold streams swirling together. I felt something rub against my leg. I looked down and almost shot out of the water like a ballistic missile. Sliding along beside me was a five-foot mako shark. But the thing wasn't attacking. It was nuzzling me, healing like a dog. Tentatively, I touched its dorsal fin. It bucked a little, as if inviting me to hold tighter. I grabbed the fin with both hands. It took off, pulling me along. The shark the shark carried me down into the darkness. It, it deposited me at the edge of the ocean proper, where the sandbank dropped into a huge chasm. It was like standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon at midnight, not being able to see much, but knowing the void was right there. The surface shimmered maybe 150 feet above. I knew I should have been crushed by the pressure. Then again, I should have not... I should have... I should have been I shouldn't have been able to breathe. I wondered if there was a limit to how deep I could go, if I could sink straight into the bottom of Pacific. Then I saw something glimmering in the darkness below, growing bigger and brighter as it rose towards me. A win- a woman's voice like my mother's called Percy Jackson. As she got closer, her shape became clearer. She had flowing black hair, a dress made of green silk. Light flickered around her, and her eyes were so distractingly beautiful. I hardly noticed the stallion-sized seahorse she was riding. She dismounted. The seahorse and the mako shark whisked off and started playing something that looked like tag. The underwater lady smiled at me. You've come far, Percy Jackson. Well done. I wasn't quite sure what to do, so I bowed. You are the woman who spoke to me in the Mississippi River. Yes, child. I am an Aed, a spirit of the sea. I am an Aed, the spirit, a spirit of the sea. It was not easy to appear so far upriver, but the Naeds, my, f- but the Naeds, my freshwater cousins, help sustain my life force. They honor Lord Poseidon, though they do not deserve, they do not serve in his court. And uh, you serve in Poseidon's court? She nodded. 
has been many years since the child of the sea god has been born. We watched you with great interest. Suddenly I remembered faces in the waves of Montauk Beach when I was a little boy. Deflections of smiling women. Like so many of the weird things in my life, I'd never given in it much thought before. If my father is so interested in me, I said, why isn't he here? Why doesn't he speak to me? A cold current rose out of the depths. Do not, uh, do not judge the Lord of the sea too harshly, the narrator told me. He stands at the brink of an unwanted war. He has much to occupy this time. his time. Besides, he is forbidden to help you directly. The gods may not show such favoritism, even to their own child, especially to them. The gods can work by indirect influence only. This is why I give you a warning and a gift. She held out her hand. Three white pearls flashed in her palm. I know, I know you journey to Hades' realm, she said. Few mortals have ever done this and survived. Orpheus, who had great music skill. Hercules, who had great strength. Houdini, who would, excla- who would escape, escape even the depths of Tartarus. Do you have these talents? Um, no, ma'am. Ah, uh, but you have something else, Percy. You have gifts. You have only, you have only begun to know. The oracles have foretold a great and terrible future for you, should you survive to manhood. Poseidon would not have you die before your time. Therefore, take these, and, you are, and when you are in need, smash a pearl at your feet. What will happen? That, she said, depends on the need. But remember, what belongs to the sea will always return to the sea. What about the warning? Her eyes flickered with green light. Go with what your heart tells you, or you will lose all. Hades feeds on doubt and hopelessness. He will trick you if he can, make you mistrust your own judgment. Once you are in his realm, he will never willingly let you leave. Keep faith. Good luck, Percy Jackson. She summoned her seahorse and rode towards the wild. Wait, I called. At the, at the river, you said not to trust the gifts. What gift? Goodbye, young hero, she called back, her voice fading into the depths. You must listen to your heart. She became a speck of glowing green and then she was gone. I wanted to follow her down into the darkness. I wanted to see the court of Poseidon, but I looked up at the sun setting on the surface. My friends are waiting. We had so little time. I kicked upward towards the shore. When I reached the beach, my clothes dried instantly. I told Grover and Annabeth what, what happened and showed them the pearls. Annabeth grimaced. No gift comes without a price. They are free. No, she shook her head. There is so, there is no such thing as a free lunch. That's an ancient Greek saying that translated pretty well into American. There will be a price. You wait. On that happy thought, we returned up. We turned our backs on the sea. With some spare change from Aries' backpacks, we took the bus into West Hollywood. I showed the driver the underworld address slip I'd taken from Auntie M's garden. Auntie M's garden emporium. But he had never heard of DOA Recording Studios. You remind me of someone I saw on TV, he told me. You, a child actor or something? Uh, I am a stunt double uh, for a lot of child actors. Oh, that explains it. We thanked him and got off quickly at the next stop. We wandered for miles on foot, looking for DOA. Nobody seemed to know where it was. It didn't appear in the phone book. Twice, we dug into alleys to avoid cop cars. I froze in front of an appliance store window because a television was playing an interview with somebody who looked very fam- familiar. My stepdad, Smelly Gay. He was talking to Barbara Walters. I mean, as if he was some kind of huge celebrity. She was interviewing him in our apartment in the middle of a poker game. And there was a young blonde, la- blonde lady sitting next to him, patting his hand. A fake tear glistened on his cheek. He was saying, Honest, Miss Small Walters, if it wasn't for sugar here, 
my grief counsellor, I'd be wrecked. My stepson took everything I cared about. My wife, my camera. I am sorry. I have trouble. I have trouble talking about it. There you have it, America. Barbara Walters turned to the camera. A man torn apart, an adult and boy with serious issues. Let me show you again the last known photo of this troubled young fugitive taken a week ago in Denver. The screen cut to a green, greeny shot of me. Annabeth and Grover standing outside the Colorado diner, talking to Aries. Who are the other children in this photo? Barbara Waters asked dematically. Who is the man with them? Is Percy Jackson and de- a delinquent, a terrorist, or perhaps the brainwashed victim of a frightening new cult? When we come back, we chat with the leading child psychologist. Stay tuned, stay tuned, America. Come on, Grover told me. He hauled me away before I could punch a hole in the appliance store window. It got dark and hung, and hungry-looking characters started coming out on streets to play. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a New Yorker. I don't scare easy, but LA had a totally different feel from New York. Back home, everything seemed close. It didn't matter how big the city was; you could get anywhere without getting lost. The street pattern and the subway made sense. There was a system to how things worked. A kid could be safe as long as he want, wasn't stupid. L.A. wasn't like that. It was spread out, chaotic, hard to move around. It reminded me of Aries. It wasn't enough of L.A. to be big. It had to prove it was big by being loud and strange and difficult to navigate to. I didn't know how we were ever going to find the entrance to the underworld by tomorrow, the summer solstice. We. We walked past gang bangers, bums, and street hawkers who looked at us like they were trying to figure out if we were worth the trouble of mugging. As we hurried past the entrance of an alley, a voice from the darkness said, "Hey, you!" Like an idiot, I stopped. Before I knew it, we were surrounded. A gang of kids had encircled us. Six of them, in all, white kids with expensive clothes and mean faces. Like the king, like like the kids at Yancey Academy, rich brats playing at being bad boys. Instinct, instinctively, I uncapped Triptide. When the sword appeared out of nowhere, the kids backed off. But their leader was either really stupid or really brave, because he kept coming at me with the switchblade. I made the mistake of swinging. The kid yelped, but he must have been one hundred percent mortal, because the blade passed. Harmlessly, right through his chest. He looked down. What the? I figured I had about three seconds before he shocked on to anger. Run! I screamed at Annabeth and Grover. We pushed two kids out of the way and raced down the street, not knowing where we were going. We turned a sharp corner. There! Annabeth shouted. Only one store on the block looked open. Its windows glaring with neon. The sign above the door said something like. Krusty's water body old piece. Krusty's water bed palace. Grover translated. It didn't sound like a place I'd ever go in, except in an emergency. But this is definitely definitely qualified. We burst through the doors, ran behind a water bed, and ducked. A split second later, the gang kids ran past outside. I think we lost them. Grover panted. A voice behind us boomed. Lost who? We all jumped. Standing behind us was a guy who looked like a raptor in a leisure suit. Suit. He was at least seven feet tall with absolutely no hair. He had grey, leathery skin, thick-lidded eyes, and a cold reptilian smile. He moved towards us slowly, but I got the feeling he could move fast if he needed to. His suit might have come from the Lotus Casino. It belonged back in the seventies, big time. The shirt was silk parsley. Unbuttoned halfway down his hairless chest, the lapels on his velvet jacket were as wide as landing strips. The silver chains around his neck—I couldn't even count them. I'm Krusty," he said, with a tartar yellow smile. I—I I resisted the urge to say yes. You are. Sorry to barge in," I told him. "You were just um, browsing. You mean hiding from those no good kids?" He grumbled. "They hang out." They hang around every night. I get a lot of people in here. 
thanks to them say you want to look at a look at a water bed i was about to say no thanks when he put a huge paw on my shoulder and steered me deeper into the showroom there was every kind of water bed you could imagine different kinds of wood different patterns of sheet queen size king size emperor of the universe size this is my most popular model crusty spread his hands proudly over a bed covered with black satin sheets with built in lava lamps on the el- headboard the mattress vibrated so it looked like all flavored jello millions hand massage crusty told us go on try it out shoot take a nap i don't care no business today anyway um i said i don't think million hand massage grower cried and drove in oh you guys this is so cool hmm just he said stroking his leather chin almost 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 what i asked he looked at anavit do me a favor and try this one over here honey might fit anavit said but but what he patted her reassuringly on the shoulder and led her over to the safari deluxe model in the teak wood lion carved into the frame and a leopard pattern comforter when arabet didn't want to lie down crusty pushed her hey she protested crusty stabbed his fingers or go ropes sprang from the side of the bed lashing around and a bit holding her to the mattress grow tried to get up but ropes sprang from his black black satin bed too and lashed him down not cool he yelled his voice vibrating from the million hand massage not cool at all the giant almost the giant looked at anabeth then turned towards me and grinned almost darn it i tried to step away but his hand shot out and clamped around the back of my neck whoa kid don't worry we'll find you one in a sec let my friends go oh sure i will but i got to make them fit first what do you mean all the beds are exactly 6 feet see your friends are too short got to make them fit and with a grower kept struggling can't stand him can't stand in perfect measurements crusty muttered or go a new set of ropes leaped out of the top and bottom of the beds wrapping around grower and and its ankles they then around the rampets the ropes started tightening pulling my friends from both ends don't worry crusty told me these are stretching jobs maybe 3 extra inches on their spines they might even live now why don't we find a bed like you you like huh percy grover yelled my mind was racing i knew i couldn't take on this giant water bed salesman alone he would snap my neck before i got my sword out your real name's not crusty is it i asked legally it's procrustus he admitted the stretcher i said i remembered the story the giant who tried to kill theseus with excess hospitality on his way to athens yeah the salesman said but who can pronounce procrustus bad for business now crusty anybody can say that you're right it's got a good ring to it his eyes lit up you think so oh absolutely i said and the workmanship on these beds fabulous he grinned hugely but his fingers didn't loosen on my neck i tell my customers that every time nobody gathers to look at the workmanship how many built in lava lamps lava lamp headboards have you seen not too many that's right percy anabeth yelled what are you doing don't mind her i told procrust i told crusty she's impossible the giant laughed all my customers are never 6 feet exactly so inconsiderate and then they explain and then they complain about the fitting what do you do if they are longer than 6 feet oh that hap oh that happens all the time it's a simple fix he let go of my neck but before i could react he reached behind a nearby sales desk and desk and brought out a huge double bladed brass axe he said i just sent it the subject and best i can and lop whatever hangs over i just sent it the subject as best i can and lop of whatever hangs on over either end ah i said swelling hard sensible i'm so glad to come across an intelligent customer the 
The ropes were really stretching my friends now, and Abeth was turning pale. Grover made gurgling sounds like a strangled goose. So crusty, I said, trying to keep my voice light. I glanced at the sales tags on the Valentine-shaped honeymoon special. Does this one really have dynamic stabilizer to stop wave motion? Absolutely. Try it out. Yeah, maybe I will. But would it work even for a big guy like you? No waves at all? Guaranteed. No way. Way? Show me. He sat down eagerly on the bed, patted the mattress. No waves, see? I snapped my fingers. Or go. Rope slashed around Krusty's and flattened him against the mattress. Hey! He yelled. Center him just right, I said. The ropes readjusted themselves at my command. Krusty's whole head stuck out top. His feet stuck out the bottom. No, he said. Wait, this is just a demo. I encaped Riptide. A few, sim- a few simple adjustments. I had no qualms about that. I was about to do it if Krusty were a human. I couldn't hurt him anyway. If he was a monster, he deserved to turn into dust for a while. You drive a hard bargain, I told myself. I'll give you 30% of unselected floor models. I think I'll start with the top. I raised my swords. No money down. No interest for six months. I swung the sword. Krusty stopped making f- offers. I cut the rope on the other beds. Annabeth and Grover got to their feet, groaning and wincing and cursing me a lot. You look taller, I said. Very funny, Annabeth said. Be faster next time. I looked at the bulletin board behind Krusty's sales desk. There was <clears throat> an advertisement for Hermes delivery surface and another for all new compendium of LA area monsters. The only monsters yellow pages you'll ever need, unless that a bright orange flyer for DOA recording studios offering commissions for hero souls. We are, we are always looking for new talent. DOA's address was right underneath with the map. Come on, I told my give I told my friends. Give us a minute, Grover complained. We were almost stretched to death. Then you're ready for Underworld, I said. It's only a block from here. 